two-tier system is very distinct from other constitutional structures. The American one is a good comparator. Within the American system, there is a clear division between Congress and the President. The Congress is made up of the House of Representatives, the Senate. Here we have a bicameral system where we have the House of Representatives or Parliament, but we also have the House of Lords that serves almost a senatorial role. But the House of Lords are appointed by the Prime Minister's office. The ruling party appoints the executive, the executive appoints the judiciary, and the executive also appoints the Senate. Within the American system, the public votes for Congress, so that includes representatives and senators. In some states, the public actually votes for judges as well. We also have, within the American system, a vote for the president. Different system because all I'm doing is electing a representative. That representative happens to be a member of the party, and that party itself has a head, a leader. And those representatives are effectively agreeing that that person will lead the party, and because they lead the party, they are appointed as the prime minister. What happens when the party changes its mind? And it could be midway through a term. We see this has happened several times in Australia where there's a change in the party leadership and the change in party leadership translates into a change in the prime minister. This issue also arose in Canada a couple of years ago when the oppositional parties were going to come together and form a majority. And the rhetoric that was surrounding the Prime Minister and his party at the time, who only had a minority government, is that the people had voted for him as Prime Minister. And this was an anti-democratic move on the part of the opposition, because they were trying to subordinate public will to party politics. That is the nature of the Westminster system. It is all based around ruling party. The public never voted for Harper. If you're voting for a representative and that representative belongs to a party and that party has decided who the leader is going to be. Entirely different from the American system where you vote for the president. So that brings us to the question then, how are members of parliament selected? There are two systems that are common to parliamentary governments. What we refer to as FPP for short and MMP also for short. So FPP stands for first past the post. The candidate or even the party that accrues the highest number of votes wins. Imagine within a constituency, there are 20,000 people who are registered to vote, 15,000 vote, 6,000 vote for one, 4,000 vote for another, and 5,000 vote for a third. The one with 6,000 wins. The party that accrues the highest number of representatives wins. First past the post system, very simple. FPP systems, first past the post systems, are usually dominated by two parties. And so it's easy to present two positions. We're in favor of this and we're against it. And so you simply look to the party that you happen to be most in favor with. So we can see there's sort of a, an ontological predilection towards two party politics. An MMP system is different. Within an MMP system, each voter, there are different MMP systems, but the standard one, each voter has two votes. They will vote for a local member of parliament, but then they also vote for a preferred party. Parties that pass, the standard varies again, but it's usually somewhere around 5%. Parties that achieve more than 5% threshold are awarded seats according to the percentage of votes that they've obtained. Why have some democracies moved in the direction of MMP, meaning moved away from FPP? How would that have changed the makeup of the current parliament that we have in the UK? It'd be simple just to look at the numbers. And if you look at the numbers, what we see is that 63% of people who voted, we're not even talking about those who didn't vote, 63% of those who voted did not vote for the majority government. The majority government only achieved 37% of those who voted. Not even of registered voters, not even of eligible voters, because we have eligible voters, it's the widest category. 
Then from there it narrows it down and we have registered voters. And then we narrow it down further and say those who actually vote. So they achieved 37% of those who actually voted. And yet there's a majority government. So you have that kind of a situation and people say, well, it's slightly, maybe more than slightly, undemocratic since a majority didn't vote for the government that rules. And the only reason it has happened in that way is because of the procedures surrounding voting. Not because of the substance, but because of the procedures. Much of the debate around elections is around the delineation of constituencies so as to create what are referred to as safe seats. So we monitor voting patterns and we see that it's tied very much to communities and we try to carve sections out so as to isolate different communities. I'll give you an example, an interesting one in the United States, in the state of Texas. There is actually one constituency that stretches from San Antonio to Austin, 100 miles apart maybe, these two cities, and yet it makes up one constituency, and it's one sliver that goes all the way through and then encompasses a large chunk of black Americans, and then stretches all the way across to San Antonio and circles a large chunk of black Americans. So now this is one constituency with one Democrat. So you engage in that type of play. And in the UK, where we have hundreds of seats, in fact, the focus on the part of the two major parties was solely on 98 seats. The 98 ones that we knew were not safe seats and could shift one way or another. So campaigning wasn't across the nation, it was in those seats in particular, the first past the post system. With an MMP system, the situation changes. And that's where coalitions become possible. And these smaller parties will offer support to the larger parties in exchange for opportunity to see some of their policies, their policy objectives become law. Uh, we saw during the last government that we had here in the UK, a coalition between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives. And the Liberal Democrats had a wish list of what they would like to see and they traded support, they provided support to the Conservatives so as to advance a couple of their policy objectives. And in exchange for that, they're in government and they would support the Conservative government and their policy objectives as well. So not everyone has an MMP system, we know that much. Um, in South America, the approach isn't MMP. In South America, they have a minimum 50% threshold. You're required to win to achieve a minimum of 50% of the vote. Let's say you have four candidates and you'll have a first round of voting and if Madeleine achieves the 50%, well she wins and she's now the president. But if she only achieves 45%, Rohin achieves 35, Alexandra gets 5, Lauren achieves 4. Well, we eliminate Lauren and now we go back to these three and there's another round of voting. Then this time, Madeleine achieves 46. But Rohin's number goes up to 39 because a chunk of the voters from Lauren support Rohin. And then Alex loses out. And then now we have a runoff between these two, but there will be some type of negotiation that takes place. The idea behind that is that ultimately the government that emerges is one that has a minimum of majority. We're saying the minimum required to be a government is a majority of support from the public and that that majority is going to be more representative than simply going by that initial vote because now there's been opportunity for some deliberations, for some negotiations to take place. So it's compulsory voting and then that voting itself is made obligatory in different ways. Um, in Brazil you can't obtain a passport if you haven't voted in the last election. Uh, the way they present it, they say a passport is a privilege that is afforded to people who take the responsibility seriously. And voting is a duty that you have toward your community. Participating, political participation is a duty. Other places will have punishments of sorts. Uh, it can be a fine, it can go as far as I think 30 days imprisonment in Ecuador. Uh, these are rarely enforced, but the idea is more to create the mindset where you, you're meant to understand that you have a duty towards everyone else. What you tend to see is higher voter turnout rates 
um, in part, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with fear of punishment. It tends to do, as I said before, you've conditioned people toward participating. So if you see voter turnout rates in a number of South American countries, the last time I remember I looked this up, the average was somewhere around 78%. That would be significantly higher than anything we see in Canada or the United States or the UK. Uh, but then you can also go to continental Europe where they don't have um, any type of uh, obligatory uh, uh, votes, voting, and you still have higher voter turnout rates than here. Some have suggested that has to do with coalition politics and the fact that you actually have parties, so they have MMP systems, and so your vote has, um, can have an influence then on the outcome, as opposed to the governments in, say, Canada or the UK that are dominated by two parties, two parties that seem to be merging almost into one party. So with that being the case, people simply uh, pull out the system, withdraw. All right, so we'll leave it at that, and I'll see everyone tomorrow then. Mixed member proportion? Yeah. Did I not say that before? Sorry, I should have, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. MMP.